a reading from 1 Corinthians chapters 12 until 14. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of powerful deeds. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work powerful deeds? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body, so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. And now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts and especially that you may prophesy. For those who speak in a tongue do not speak to other people but to God, for no one understands them since they are speaking mysteries in the Spirit. But those who prophesy speak to other people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Those who speak in a tongue build up themselves, but those who prophesy build up the church. Now I would like all of you to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. One who prophesies is greater than who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you in some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So with yourselves, since you are striving after spiritual gifts, seek to excel in them for building up the church. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. What should be done then, my brothers and sisters? 
When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. The spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is a God, not of disorder, but of peace. So my brothers and sisters, strive to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. All right, I'm having problems with mics today. We'll see how this goes. Thank you very much for reading that. That was a long section of scripture, and I'm hoping some of you got a chance to read parts of that during the week. Um, we'll be touching on large parts of it, and I'm going to be teaching, um, and the teaching that I'm going to be working from is not stuff that I originally came up with myself. Uh, Tim Dyer from Tasmania was a guy who impacted me quite a bit on my early years, and he did this where he showed some charts and he did all this stuff with it and he talked about gifts and I was like, wow, I'd never heard it explained that I'm going to try doing. Now, that was 20 some years ago and I've been teaching this for 20 some years and keep developing it, working on it and doing different things. So I don't know what parts to credit to Tim and which parts to credit to me. So just think of it this way. If it's really good, say, thank you, Tim. And you're like, oh. I don't know about that. Just say, hey, that's the stuff I came up with later. So we'll go with that. Why don't we pray quickly and then we'll keep going. So join me in prayer here for a moment. God, as we come and as we look at a large section of scripture, open us to your spirit's guidance. Give us the understanding that only comes through you. And help us to understand how you love us, you gift us, and how you want us to engage in the world. Come, and may the words that I speak be from you. And may whatever you want to be heard stay with people, and everything else just fall away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is a large section of teaching, and people are like, why, Micah, are you trying to teach over three chapters? Why don't you pick a couple of key verses and teach from that? Well, the problem is, what I'm trying to do is teach a little bit about the Spirit because we are getting into a, a theme here. And actually, I forgot my clicker. Hey, it's working. So this is our theme for today. But we're working with a bigger theme for the, the entire month. And this is around the Spirit with us. So last month we had Pentecost, and at Pentecost we talked a little bit about when the Spirit came. There was three main things that came with the Spirit, and the Spirit was bringing God's presence with us, and God's presence also got, brought God's power. Also we got understanding and insight that we couldn't have without the Spirit. And we talked a bit about how the disciples didn't really get what Jesus was about until the Spirit came, and then they went, oh, is that what you were on about? And I just want to do one other thing. There was a form of speaking in tongues that came from that. And we'll come back to that. So this is our theme for this month. And I've added a little extra thing there that we'll talk about as we go. But I want to quickly go through sort of several sections of this bigger teaching. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church is one that he started and then went on his way to someplace else. And he starts hearing all sorts of reports of problems in Corinth. So he's sending this letter saying, okay, you guys got to get your act together. And he goes through different sections and hits different issues that they're struggling with. And in this bigger section from 11 through 14, he's talking about the gathering to worship. And he's giving them instructions. And later on when we come to communion, that's what chapter 11 is about. And he's talking about that. But then he starts at the beginning of chapter 12, and he says, I want you to know about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant on this. I want you to know about spiritual gifts. And he launches in, and for the next three chapters, it's his major rant on spiritual gifts. But we often break it up, and when we break it up and don't read it all together, I think we miss certain things. And in that big section, one of the most important things is that spiritual gifts, what they're for is for the building up 
of the body, the building up or the common good, except for one of three different types of speaking in tongues. Now, how many of you knew that there's different speaking in tongues? When I said that to me, I was like, what? Wait a minute. But think about it. If you saw at Pentecost, there was the different forms of everybody being someone else's language. That was a form of speaking in tongues. It was given the gift to speak in other people's languages. Speaking in tongues, number one. That is for the common good, for other people. The second one is not for the common good, but it says later on in this passage that it is for the building up of our own soul, or it's good for us, but it's not necessarily beneficial for others. And that is the prayer language of speaking in tongues where our soul talks with God. This is often what people think about of speaking in tongues because you hear somebody who's praying in this way and it doesn't make a lot of sense to other people. So that's the second form of speaking in tongues and it's really for your own benefit and we'll come back and touch on this in a little bit. The third way is talked about in this passage and it's when there is a speaking in tongues that needs an interpretation for others. It's often a form of prophecy or a bringing of a message that then the community has this insight but Paul's very clear, if you don't have people to interpret, don't do this. So it's a way of having discernment when a vision or a speaking of God has come and that the community interprets that. So when you think of spiritual gifts, their whole point is for the building up the body, all of them except for one of those speaking in tongues. Are you with me so far? Okay. Some of you look like last night was a long night and you're still not with us. Maybe I'll we'll have to get you up and dancing a bit and then you'll be with me. So when Paul gets into this, the first section he's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. And he starts saying that it's one spirit that gives this and it's as the spirit chooses. And the key thing with that is sometimes I've heard people is, oh, we're going to have you practice speaking in tongues. Well, you can't choose a spiritual gift. The passage makes it very clear that the Spirit gives spiritual gifts as the Spirit chooses, not as we choose. We can be open to them, but it's not magic. It's not like, I've got this gift, it's mine, I'm going to use it whenever I want. We can be open to God's movement, but it's not something that we control. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Now that's something we can practice, but we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. In this section, it says there's all these different gifts. The Spirit gives as the Spirit chooses, when the Spirit chooses, how the Spirit chooses, to whoever the Spirit chooses, and it's for us to be open or not. And I don't think God is one that enforces things on us. But God says, if this is something, and we'll come back to a little bit of how God uses that with us, if you're open to it, I can empower you to do. And I think that's where spiritual gifts are. Then he moves on and talks about this huge section about the body. And I think in many ways, we have this whole thing of we think, oh, that is a person who's gifted. They're up the front. We've got somebody who's playing an instrument so well. They're gifted. I don't have that gift. But this section makes it clear that regardless of what the giftings are, they're all special. They're all important. They're all critical to the working of the body. Now, if you don't believe that, Think about your big toe. I never really thought how much your big toe affects you until I played ultimate with a guy who had an infection in his big toe and he couldn't, he had eventually had to have it cut off. You know what happens when you don't have your big toe? You fall in. And it was funny to see him run after that. He had to relearn how to run because his balance was off and every time he'd take a step, he would fall in. And the big toe is critical for balance. I had no clue with that. What I'm trying to say, and I think what Paul's saying, is it doesn't matter what part, what gifting you have, all of them are important for the body. And all of them have a way that they build up the body. Then at the end of that section, Paul says, and now I will show you a more important, or more, hang on, let me get the right words here. Some of you are saying it already. What's the exact line? More excellent way. There we go. A more excellent way. And then he jumps into 1 Corinthians 13, which we often read on its own. And it's all about love. And it's central to his whole teaching here. And I'm going to come back to that. 
But I think it's really interesting that we often read that totally separate and not connected to gifting and spiritual gifting. But we say, oh, isn't this great? It's all about love. Well, it's really the heart about spiritual gifting. After that section, he jumps into and he talks about this difference between prophecy and speaking in tongues. And he talks back and forth with it. Now remember, he's speaking to a congregation that is in many ways having this really disrupted forms of worship. They're talking over each other. Some people are teaching, then somebody else is jumping up and teaching. There's people standing up and praying in tongues in a loud voice and sort of disrupting the worship. So he's not trying to downplay speaking in tongues. He is trying to give some order to when speaking in tongues work well for you and when it works well for the community. Now I think of this from my own life, when this difference between speaking in tongues, who it benefits, versus speaking in a way that somebody can understand. There was this couple that was kind of doing some discipleship with my wife and I. And as we finished up that time, they asked if they could pray for us. And we said, sure. And they said, can we lay hands on you? Yes, sure. And they said, can we pray over you in tongues? We went, sure. And the husband got up there and he prayed, blah, 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 blah. And I had no idea what he was saying. And really, it was probably great for him to pray for us in that way. But for me, it did nothing. And at the end of that long section of him praying, his wife had about three sentences that she said in English, and I could understand it. And as we walked away, both my wife and I were like, wasn't that powerful? And it wasn't all of his praying, but it was those few words that she said that we understood. And I think this is critical here when we're thinking about spiritual gifts. It's again, what is the benefit for other people? So if you're thinking about your own spiritual gifts, and you're thinking about it, if it's not something that's benefiting others, and it's not that one form of speaking in tongues, it probably isn't a spiritual gift. Does that make sense to you? But if it's something that benefits others, then it's possibly a spiritual gift. But how do spiritual gifts work? I want to show you a model that works with some of that centrality of the concept of love. All right, just go ahead. Oh, there it went, it went eventually, excellent. So this might seem really confusing, all sorts of lines and things. This is a prism, and I wanna talk through how a prism works first, and then talk about spiritual gifts and how they work through us with God's love. If you see a prism, it's just a crystal or a bit of glass until you stick it in the sun. And then it takes the invisible light that's coming in and it makes it visible into these beautiful colors. So I wanna use that concept and talk about spiritual gifts. So again, invisible light coming in and then going through that. And it's interesting, you can actually put a dink or a little something or an imperfection in the, the prism and it affects how the light comes out. Or if you have it where its folds are different, it's the same colors, but they sort of look different as they come out. So here's how I think this works for us and spiritual gifting. Remember that concept of the centrality of love, and without love, none of the spiritual gifts are beneficial. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, all these things will come to an end, but not love. There's this central thing of love is what empowers us for other people. So if you're thinking about how do I have spiritual gifts in my own life, one of the things is how are we letting God's love into us? There's a way of forming us in spiritual faith where it says God loves us and we need to just get that into our heads. And I was like, okay, cool, this is great. And then they say, no, God really loves you. Oh, great. No, God really loves you. And they just keep repeating this, God loves you, God loves you, because so often we have it as a head knowledge but we don't fully get it into the core of who we are, that we are loved by God. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, I talked about that. How do we build our identity on being the beloved of God? This is that same building on how are we letting God fully into us, letting God's love flow into us and then flow out of us? How do we truly understand that God loves us? So if you're having trouble thinking about your spiritual gifts, maybe there's a blockage between you letting God's love or light coming into you. And again, think about that prism. If it doesn't have light, 
It's a fancy weight, but other than that, it's nothing else. But as soon as it's in the light, then something happens. As we let God's love into us, then it sort of activates our gifting. And like I talked about, how that prism is, is like how we're each shaped. Some people say, well, will God gift me in this way? God does it however God chooses, but it makes sense to me that if God gifts you in a certain way, for me, God gave me a gift of gab and a little bit of boldness and also sometimes an insight into other people. That combination, when God's love comes in, it makes sense that I speak trying to have something insightful and loving from God to say to others. Does that make sense? Now, if it suddenly is that God gifts me with the ability to write music, that's possible, but it doesn't seem very likely to me because God hasn't really gifted me with that. Now, Glenn or Colm, yes, it makes sense for them. God's gifting through them with who they are. That makes sense. Are you following with me here? So some of how I encourage people to think about spiritual gifts is thinking about who are you? What are the things that have had led you to here? What are the things maybe you're not so good at? What are the spots where you've been wounded in that the Spirit is working with you and may be able to eventually work with others in that same thing? Also, what are the things you get passionate about? What are the things that you're just like so excited about? But also, what are the things that frustrate you? One of the ways that I finally went, okay, maybe God, you are calling me to be a pastor, is I got so frustrated sitting in the pews and listening to teaching and going, this is boring, or saying, that is just an inappropriate way to teach this scripture passage. And because I was so passionate with it, somebody finally said, Micah, maybe this is something that you should be doing because it's something that gets you fired up. It's fun to talk to somebody about something they're passionate about. You can see it on their face. They get more animated. These are the ways that I think God has gifted us. So if we're thinking about God's spirit empowering us, often I think it's who are we? What are the passions that God's given us? Then when we have God's love pouring into us, that might empower it to do this next part. Now, if we look up here, we've got spiritual gifts and visible light. Part of what spiritual gifts are God's love made visible to the world through us to meet needs. Let me say that again. It's spiritual gifts are God's love through who God made us to be to become visible in the world to meet needs. So one of the ways that some people are like, well, I'm not speaking, my own spiritual gifts aren't coming out. Well, are you insulating yourself from other people's needs? Is there something that's in between you and other people who have needs? If you're not around people who have needs or in situations that you can be building up somebody else, why would God empower you to do something that doesn't need there? Are you following what I'm saying with that? So if you want spiritual gifts to come out of you, working on how is it that I'm letting God's love into me, but also how am I in proximity of those that are in need? And that may be that we need somebody to lead music. It may mean, like Matt, that we need somebody to sort of work on how do we do justice around uh, rental spaces. Or maybe it's something else. Think about what you're passionate about and where are the needs that are there. And then also, what does it mean for God to empower you through love in that situation? Now that may be like, oh Micah, you're making this too logical. But I think Paul and God work in structural, logical ways. If we think of the first creation story, God takes this disordered and makes the world in a very orderly way. Now that doesn't mean that there's not spontaneous, there's not all sorts of things that happen. But I think as Paul is teaching about spiritual gifts, there's one other key line, and I'm going to wrap up after this. He says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Which the first time I read that, I was like, yep, sounds good. Don't know what to do with that. And then I started hearing people that when they talked about the Spirit, they were like, the Spirit came onto me and I did all this stuff and it was awesome, but I didn't feel like I was in control. And I went, hmm, that doesn't sound to me like God working with people. God doesn't take us over. God doesn't possess us. God works love through us. And it is, there are times that it's brought out in joy and we might feel very exuberant to do things that we might not do other times. 
but I don't think God possesses us. And I think that's a critical part here. God's love empowers us to meet needs. And I'm gonna wrap up on this. So I want you to take a little bit of time to pause and think. And sometime we may come back and go more into detail because there's so much in this passage that I'm not touching. But normally when I do this teaching and hit everything, I do it as a three-day weekend training and you don't want to sit in the pew for the next three days. So let me ask you a couple of questions and then we'll pray as we wrap up. Think about your relationship with God. How are you letting God's love in? And what are the things that are in between you and God at the moment? What are the things that are stopping you really feeling like you are loved, that you are valuable? Maybe it's a self-image thing. Maybe it's something that's been told to you from years ago. Maybe it's a struggle to see God as actually a loving God. Whatever it is, I encourage you to spend some time thinking about how do I truly let that love in and move that other stuff out of the way? Then I encourage you to think about where is it that you're gifted and passionate? And where are the needs that you're gifting and you're passionate could step in proximity to and that God's love can pour through you and meet that need? Where is this that the Spirit is inviting you to be empowered by the Spirit to meet the needs of the world? God's love through you. Let me close this in prayer as you're thinking about those two things. God, as we come and as we reflect on how your love comes into us, how it empowers us, give us your insight. Help us to deal with the things inside us that are, that are holding us back from feeling truly loved from you, truly valued. May your spirit work in just powerful ways into us and help us to feel your love, to know your love, to be consumed by your love that it is who we are. And God, open our eyes to the places around us that you want us to come and be your visible love, both as individuals and as a bigger church community. Help us to see Give the Spirit to us in ways of understanding so that we can meet the needs of the world empowered by you. Spirit, come on us. Fill us. Help us to be able to speak with your power. Help us to be able to live through your power. Help us to be able to worship through your power. Come, Spirit, and empower us with your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.